What's up, everybody? Happy Thanksgiving. Welcome to the Canes Insight Daily Podcast, powered by Anajar and Levine, accident attorneys. Like we always say, rain, sleet, or shine, holiday, no holiday, we are on every day talking about the latest with the Canes. A lot to be thankful for. We'll get into that. Also going to talk to Mike McAllister of Cuse Nation on 247. Go behind enemy lines a little bit. Learn about Syracuse from the Syracuse perspective. Huge, huge, huge game with tons of playoff implications on Saturday for the Miami Hurricanes. But uh, Pete, how are we doing? How are we feeling? Doing great, man. Happy Thanksgiving to everybody. Was just telling you before we recorded here, it feels like the game's tomorrow, but we have we have this this whole nother day in between. So get an antsy for Saturday, man. Excited for for this one. It's uh, you know, I people are asking, is this a trap game? There's I don't I don't see how there's any trap involved here. You have the ultimate goal in front of you, which is to wrap up an ACC championship berth for the second time in program history. And it's a really solid team that they ha- that they have up there. Well coached, you know, obviously an offense that can score a lot of points and, and has been very successful through the air this season. So excited to talk to Mike McAllister, kind of get his view on, on this team and look first year for Fran Brown. To me, it's not, it's, I didn't have huge expectations for them this season, but Kyle McCord has really given them, uh, you know, a shot in the arm. And look, if your case needs a shot in the arm, dial 1-800-747-373 for Anajar and Levine accident attorneys. Again, that is Anajar and Levine accident attorneys. If you or someone you care about has been involved in an accident, you could be entitled to significant compensation. 1-800-747-FREE, 1-800-747-3733. Take back control of your life with Anajar and Levine. So Pete, just Thanksgiving, right? We should be talking about things that we are thankful for. Obviously, we're all thankful for our family. Just got out of church. That's why I'm wearing this. But in terms of the Canes, there's a lot more to be thankful for than usual. I know for me, just getting it started, I'm thankful for the three touchdown humiliations of Florida and Florida State. Really thankful for Florida State's whole debacle of a season. But the ability of Miami to go ahead and put that exclamation point, smash Florida State quite easily, almost in boring fashion, and then really ruin UF season right from the start. You know, they're ch- celebrating being 500. They had bigger goals, but of course they were destroyed by the Hurricanes in game one. So that is what, uh, from a Kane's perspective, what I'm most thankful for right now, that state championship. Look, the cliche answer would be for everyone to say Cam Ward. And obviously that goes without saying that that we're all thankful for for his presence and, and what he's brought to the table for this team. But I'm going to go with, a consistent run game, a consistent power run game, D, because for the last 15, 20 years, we've we've been looking for that franchise quarterback, obviously, right? And you have that now in Cam Ward, but you've had talented running backs and you've had run run games that were very successful, but there was always that point of the season where it would go stagnant. They they weren't consistently able to get these third and ones, third and twos. This is the first year that I can really say that that you have a, a real run game to complement the quarterback because, again, have you had that first round pick at quarterback? No, but you've had very successful passing attacks with Brad Kaya, De'Eric King, Stephen Morris, and you know statistically some of these numbers that these these passing attacks were putting up were awesome, but you did not have the complementary run game to go along with it. Again, you've had talented backs, Duke Johnson, Lamar Miller, Mike J- Mike James, you know, a, a lot a long list, but you have a real consistent power run game here this season. And I think that's gonna go a long way here in this home stretch of the season for them. Yeah, when third and short, fourth and short, you're not even worried about it a little bit. When you know you're going to punch it in to the end zone when you get close, just with power running, it's it's a treat. Obviously, Thanksgiving, right? John Madden, that's what you think about. I know John Madden, looking down, would be proud of that Miami Hurricanes run game. I'll pick up something you said, and I will say thank you know be, be thankful for Cam Ward, but really for Cam Ward and Restrepo, that connection, and not just all the production they have on the field, but this is the first time Miami's had real stars in a while national stars stars that you see little kids wearing the uniforms pretending to be these players making plays in the backyard i don't think miami's had that in a while that true star power they've had the duke johnson who was a great player here to Corey for a little bit was going you know Derek king had a good season but in terms of like stars that 
people know, that people want to emulate when, when they're young kids. Uh, that, to me, is the first pairing of stars that we've had in a while with Cam Ward and Xavier Estrepo. And that story is still being written, so hopefully their most iconic moments are yet to come here. Thank you for bringing up Jacory. I, I apologize for overlooking him when I was mentioning successful uh, passing attack. Shout out to Mark Whipple <laughs> as well for for that. But uh, no, it's uh, it's the offense. We have a lot to be thankful for there. So you know, obviously, I'll throw another one out there, a bonus one. I'm thankful for the maturation of Jacoby George. There you go. It's important. You know, it, a player like that could have been cast aside under prior regimes. As a, Times look like it might happen under this regime, but they developed him, nice him downfield blocking, doing all those things. And you hope he's rewarded for that effort with some big plays here down the stretch as you try to win an ACC championship and get into that playoff. So big picture, I'm thankful for the fact that we have meaningful games here in November. November has been the worst month for Miami Hurricane fans for two decades. So many bad November losses. So many times you're looking at the ACC Coastal and someone you needed to lose, lose, and then you go out and lose to like a Duke or someone terrible. So the fact that you're playing meaningful games here in November and truly meaningful games, you know, playoff implication, top 10, other teams are watching you because you are one of the top teams in the country type games. That to me is is really the story right here as we get into, into no, it's November 28th, right? This Usually this is fire coach time, coach search time. You're hoping to hold on to recruits and not lose decommitments, getting excited for recruiting battles that you'll ultimately you lose. That's been November for 20 years. So it's a breath of fresh air to be playing very meaningful games in November and the recruiting and the portal stuff that's about to come. You're going to be competing for big time players with a chance to win those battles. Without a doubt, D, and I know, obviously, we're we're very very thankful for another another entity, another group of people, and that is the Miami Hurricane Team Store across from campus. Yeah, thankful for the sale, right? Because we we're talking about thirty percent off here site wide. That means MiamiHTS.com. Everything you see on the site, thirty percent off with certain exclusions. But it's online, MiamiHTS.com. Search around, thirty percent off. Stores closed, so you're not going to get there in, in next to the thesis if you go there today. You're spending time with your family anyway, so just do your shopping here on the site. Get a head start on Black Friday. You don't need it for Black Friday for the deals. Black Friday starts now on Thursday on Thanksgiving, 30% off site-wide, MiamiHTS.com. Look at all this holiday gear. You can do all your Christmas shopping in one stop with MiamiHTS.com. Need some cold gear, man. Regardless of what happens this weekend, the temperature's gonna drop, man. I need some need some of that cold gear. So I'm gonna be placing my order today. Yeah, you get your body temperature low with those cold plunges. You need to yeah. regroup. Yeah. All right, Pete. So we got we got Mr. McAllister on from Cuse Nation. I thought that was a pretty good chat. Uh, you know, excited to to hear what he has to say. Um I think Canes fans will learn a lot about this team and some of the strengths and weaknesses. It's certainly going to be an exciting matchup because these guys don't play a boring brand of ball. Remember to like the video and subscribe to the channel as well. Coming up next here on the Canes Inside Daily Podcast, Mike McAllister of CuseNation.com. All right, joining us now on the Canes Insight Podcast. As we do every week here, we're going behind enemy lines. Mike McAllister of Syracuse on 247. You guys go follow him. Go follow his work on Syracuse on 247. Getting ready for this matchup this week. It's it's uh, it's a big one, man, as Hurricanes obviously head up to Syracuse and try to lock in their ticket to the ACC Championship of Syracuse, obviously having a really good season of their own. Mike, appreciate you joining us here on uh, Thanksgiving week. Happy Thanksgiving to you and the family. Uh, excited for this one this weekend, man. Should be a, should be a nice atmosphere out there. Yeah, I think once the schedule came out, this was one of the games Syracuse fans had circled. Now I think they were hoping that Syracuse would have a little bit more on the line, like potentially um, – a, a ACC championship game birth of their own didn't quite work out that way. But when you lose to Stanford and Boston college that, you know, can't really blame anyone but yourself there, but either way, you know, you have a top 10 opponent coming in um, to, to your home stadium and you've had uh, one of the best regular seasons they've had in, in several seasons. The, the fan base should be pretty excited. Is there a, a feel this is a rivalry from a Miami perspective? I'm a little older. I'm almost 40. So I, I remember those Syracuse Miami games in the nineties. Do you sense that 
feeling of history. I know there's a lot of people that weren't around for that, but do you feel that in the Syracuse fan base that, Hey, there's a kind of traditional rival. A little bit. Um, you know, I, I think the biggest thing that people have really been talking about with this is how they've both been in the ACC for together for about 10 years. And it's the first time Miami's come here. And I think only the second time they played at all. And that's, that's the unfortunate part when you have conference realignment is I know Syracuse and Miami have played before, as you mentioned, when they were in the Big East together. But there's a lot of new teams that are in a lot of conferences, and those teams sometimes don't play each other for several years. Syracuse didn't play SMU this year, as, as an example. Um, neither did Miami. That would have been a, a pretty good regular season game between those two teams, right? They, they're both having great years. So it, it's unfortunate with the conferences being as large as they are that you have situations like this. But I am glad that they've gotten rid of the divisions so that you can have Syracuse and Miami playing each other more often because the fact that you've only played once in a decade and is, is pretty ridiculous to be honest with you for, for any conference opponent. So yeah, I, th I think Syracuse fans are excited to get Miami back up here. For first year for Fran Brown, Mike, I mean, it's obviously it's been a great season, but were the expectations this at this point of the season, an eight, you know, eight and three, a chance to potentially win nine or, or 10 games in, in a scenario where they go to a bowl game and win and, and knock off Miami. I mean, what were the expectations heading into the season? And what would you say the temperature of the fan base is right now and the excitement level for Fran Brown and what he's been able to build already in one year? There haven't been a lot of off seasons in the last decade, even two decades, to be honest with you, where Syracuse fans have been legitimately excited about their team and started you know, how fans can get a little bit delusional at times. And, hey, if a couple things break right, maybe Syracuse has a shot to win an ACC championship game or sneak into the college football playoff. There were certainly those conversations going on. So there was a lot of expectations going into the season. I think most reasonable fans were kind of expecting an eight to nine regular season uh, win regular season. I think that's kind of where most reasonable people were expecting. I predicted eight and four going into the season. So, yeah, I, I think uh, most are, are pretty happy with the way the season has gone. The only disappointment really is, you know, you lose at Boston College winning on the road. You can lose to inferior teams. Miami lost to Georgia Tech. We know Miami's much better than Georgia Tech, right? So those things happen uh, on the road. Is losing at home to Stanford. That's really, I think, the game that really stings from a Syracuse fan perspective. But otherwise, Fran Brown is still very much in the honeymoon phase. They love what he's done on the recruiting trail. And they love that what the product they've seen so far this season. And, uh, you know, they think they're pretty excited about the future. The biggest question is after this year, you don't get Kyle McCord back. So who's going to be your quarterback, you know, next year? Watching this team, I watched about five games from this season. And just from the outside looking in, my big takeaway was offensively, ball control, extremely precise passing game, great timing, great contested catches over the middle, defensively struggling with explosive runs. Am I missing something? What's the identity do you see with the Syracuse team? That, that's pretty much it. Um, you know, the, when they played Boston College, Boston College ran for over 300 yards against them. That's why they lost the game. The last two weeks, they've been better as far as uh, being a little bit more consistent with their run defense. But to your point, they've still given up a 70-plus yard touchdown run in each of the last two weeks and then another 50-plus yard run on top of that. And if you take – basically four runs away the last two weeks, teams are averaging about a yard and a half to two yards carry, which is pretty good uh, as far as a run defense goes. But the problem is you're combining that with those those long runs, and that's that's been an issue for them. Last week, I, I thought that um, UConn had some success in the passing game that you weren't really expecting. They're not a great passing team. And so a lot of Syracuse fans are then worrying about a much better passing attack coming in this week. So they have some vulnerabilities on defense for sure. They've struggled with consistent pass rush, basically outside of Fidel Diggs. When teams double him, Syracuse hasn't had a second guy that really has been able to get consistent pressure on the quarterback. They don't blitz a ton, which has been a, a, a frustrating point for, for fans. They think they should bring more pressure. But offensively, they've been phenomenal through the air. You don't think about a team that throws the ball a lot more than it runs it being a ball control offense, but that's exactly what they are. And the running game has been very inconsistent. Some games it's really good. Some games it's really bad. You really haven't had much in between. But even in the games where it hasn't been great, because they have Kyle McCord, and as you mentioned, the contested 
catches. I think they've got three of the top four power conference uh, wide receivers in terms of most contested catches made this year. Uh, it, the offense has, has largely worked. In terms of McCord, Mike, look, obviously Syracuse throws the ball more, more than anyone in the country, but 12 interceptions on the year had the five interception game against Pitt, which, which, you know, was, was like a very interesting game, right? From the, from the start, they just didn't seem to have it, but is decision-making something that, you know, concerns you for, for him in a game like this or, or, I mean, what have the circumstances been of, of most of these interceptions? Because this is a Miami pass defense that had success last week, not against, not a great Wake Forest offense, but it's been, it's been a win for Miami. Yeah. You know, he, if you kind of throw the pit game out, cause that was kind of an anomaly, right? Five picks in one game is, is insane. And that's going to kind of skew your numbers for the whole season. But if you look at everything else, He's been pretty good. The, the He's had a couple of decisions here and there that, of course, he'd like to have back. I think every quarterback in the country can probably point to several throws they'd like to have back. But otherwise, you know, he's had a couple of picks on what were essentially punts, right, a third and long, and he kind of chucks it downfield and hopes if you get a penalty or someone can make a play and it gets picked. Um, he's had a couple where he had a guy and he just underthrew him. That's happened a couple of times. But – about 90% of the time you feel pretty good about his decision-making his command of the offense. And I know the coaching staff trusts him implicitly with that. In terms of the offense, again, I mean, we talked about it, like you said, he's the decision-making, the rhythm and the timing of the offense is really, really impressive. The ability to consistently get third downs converted, uh, very impressive. One thing that jumped out is they do a lot of damage, 10 plus yard plays, 20 plus yard plays. Then once you get to the 30 plus yard plays, it, it's not there that that's not really where they live. Miami's defense has struggled tremendously with those big, really explosive plays, right? So this game, you're looking at, you know, Miami struggling in an area where Syracuse, that's not their necessarily their forte. However, watching the tape, I see number 12, uh, really, really fast, explosive guy breaks and tackles, makes some big catches. And I understand that Syracuse might be getting some help back as far as potentially a deep threat. How do you see the deep threats or the explosive play threats on the Syracuse offense? They really have dialed back their deep attempts since about week two when Zed Haynes, the Georgia transfer, went out with personal reasons and he missed several games. He's been available the last couple of weeks but hasn't played much, and so the hope is maybe he'll be able to, to see the field a little bit this week. Justice Ross Simmons is number 12 that you mentioned. He missed a, a bunch of the year with an injury He was that he was battling from the end of, of last year at Colorado State, and he battled through it all camp and finally was able to get healthy and has had some explosive plays the last couple of weeks. But you're right. They don't go down the field very much. When they think that they have an advantage – like they did last week against UConn, they opened up the first play of the game. They threw the ball downfield to, to Daryl Gill, and he had you know about a, a 50 or 60 yard pass play on the first play. That's really out of character for them. They they try to do the short to intermediate routes and the crosses and the slants and those types of things, and even getting Aronde Gatson over the middle. That's really what the identity of the offense is. They'll take a shot every once in a while, but even though that might be be a weakness of Miami's. It, I'm not really sure outside of Zed Haynes that they really have a guy that, that's going to scare anyone uh, on the Miami sideline. He's he's really the only guy that has big-time elite-level speed. So if they get him back and he's out there in some capacity, then I could see them maybe taking a couple of shots to see if they can exploit that weakness for Miami. Otherwise, I think they're going to do a lot of what we've seen for most of the season. We talked about the rush defense, how it's you know been a, been a, a bit of an issue at times this year for Syracuse. In terms of the pass defense, obviously my Miami's uh, pass attack has been, you know, right up there with with Syracuse. Them and them and Miami have been kind of up at, at, in terms of all the metrics in the passing game. So, how, how do you see that match up in terms of the secondary for Syracuse? Well, the the biggest issue, as I mentioned before, has been their inability to put pressure on the quarterback, and so. I think they've got some good players back there in the secondary. You know, Elijah Clark, Justin Bear, and those are guys that have been around, and, and they're good players. And um, even, you know, some of their corners, even though they're, they're missing a couple of guys that have been out with injury. Um, you know, Jaden Bellamy, I think, is going to be back, and they think pretty highly of him. Clarence Lewis has played most of the season. He should be okay. They like those guys. The biggest problem is they've had to cover for a lot longer than you'd like to have basically any secondary cover. And so if if that issue 
rears its ugly head again from a Syracuse perspective against Miami, I think Cam Ward's going to have a huge day. If they're able to get pressure on him, whether that means, you know, Fidel Diggs has an unbelievable day, which he's capable of by himself and, and makes himself uh, really difficult to block, whether someone else kind of comes out of nowhere and has a good day one-on-one in pass rush, or whether Syracuse blitzes a lot more than they have in, in weeks past, I think the biggest key is whether or not they can put pressure on Cam Ward to try to speed up his process so that those defensive backs don't have to cover all of those really good Miami wide receivers for extended periods of time. In terms of the the pass rush for Miami, you know, there's a lot of talk about hey, McCord is not as athletic as some of the quarterbacks that Miami's gone against. But when you look at the stats, he's not getting sacked a ton, both because of his intellect and getting rid of it, and also this offensive line, which just from the outside looks to be a pretty good group. I know you've seen as a Syracuse fan some pretty good offensive linemen over the past decade. You know, NFL guys, even as the team kind of had its ups and downs. How do you look at this offensive line at Syracuse in the context of the ACC? They've been up and down, but I'd say the last four or five games, they've been playing better. And part of that is getting uh, David Wallaba back from injury. He was transferred last, not this past offseason, but the offseason before from Kentucky and was a starter until he got hurt last year, has been battling injury, uh, trying to get back to 100% came back, started rotating in, and played the majority of the snaps the last couple of weeks at um, left tackle. And since he's come back, that's really shored up their ability to pass protect for Kyle McCord. That's been the biggest thing. When they have pass protected and given him time and given him a clean pocket, he's picked apart every defense he's gone against. When he has not, that's when there's been issues with three and outs or the interceptions, et cetera. So that's, again, it it – it's boring to talk about, right? Pass protection and turnovers. Those are the biggest things for, for Syracuse almost every single week. Or defensively, stopping the run. It feels like it's a broken record, but it is because that's the reality of evaluating this offense. If they protect Kyle McCord, he's going to find guys and they're going to move the ball and score points. If they don't, then the offense will struggle to find consistency. But they've been better uh, pass protection-wise. As far as their run blocking goes, that's been – very inconsistent all season. They've had a couple of of games where they flashed, I would say, but largely it hasn't been that great most of the season. Mike, I, I alluded to the potential atmosphere there. Fran Brown was calling for for game day to be up there this weekend, and you know, obviously, it's it's going to be the uh, the break, the Thanksgiving break for the students. But what do you expect in terms of the crowd, and and what's the hype kind of like up there this week? Uh, for this matchup that's the only unfortunate part is the timing of it right the fact that the students won't be here or they'll be just coming back i'm sure some will come back specifically for this because when you're kind of experiencing college as as a student this is a game you would want to go to um and if it is a high scoring shootout game like i think most are kind of expecting between the number one number two passer in the country I mean, that's that's a great game to the go show. to, yeah. you know, so why wouldn't you want to go attend that, watch it? And that could be, you know, something you remember for for the rest of your life, regardless of how it plays out. So, yeah, I think they'll come back, but they're expecting the largest crowd of the season. I think um, I'm not sure if it's going to get to a sellout. I think last I checked, there were somewhere in the three to five thousand tickets still available, but it's going to be the largest uh, of the season. Hopefully the butts and seats match that. But regardless, even when they've been at 75, 80 percent capacity, the crowds that have been there this season have been great. They've been fantastic. They've been loud. They've been into it. Um, So I I expect you're going to see something similar this weekend. Long term with Syracuse, obviously the momentum is there. New coach. I think back to just a history of, of great players that, quite frankly, very few teams can match. Even if you look at a team like Georgia, which is such a big program. Georgia does not have the history as far as truly great players that a Syracuse does. So in this NIL era, is there a commitment or an energy now that you have some positive momentum on the field to really crank this thing up and make Syracuse a, a, a top program, a do- program that dominates the Northeast and gets some of these Penn State kids? Or is it kind of business as usual, funds are going to be a little lower and you're just happy to get what you get? Well, I mean, right now, if if you're comparing Syracuse to a Georgia or even to a Penn State from an NIL and funds perspective, yeah, they're they're not on the same level. But when you talk to Fran Brown, that's absolutely what his goal is. And he's made no bones about that from his opening press conference when he was hired. He said, I want to compete for national championships. 
And I think a lot of people kind of looked around the room and said, really, it's Syracuse. And, you know, they've had great players and they had a good 15 year run where it seemed like they were in the top 25 and had really good teams every single year. And that's fallen off the wayside the last two decades. But that's what he thinks he can get this program back to. And he does have more backing financially than what they've had under previous regimes. I do think that's increasing. And the more that he wins and the more buzz he gets and the more high profile recruits and transfers he gets, the more that's that's going to continue. So it really all snowballs on itself like anything. If, if people see a good product on the field, they see excitement, then they want to get behind it and support it. If you don't and after, you know, if Syracuse wins eight, nine games, depending on how this game and the bowl game play out. And then next year they win five and they win five to six for two or three years in a row, then some of that's going to fade away. If they continue to win eight to nine games a year for, you know, three, four years in a row, that's going to continue to increase. And then you'll see Syracuse start to be able to compete with some of those other Northeast schools uh, on the recruiting trail. Well, great stuff. Mike, do you have anything else uh, you want, you want to ask him? No, make sure Mike plugs his site. Cause there's yeah, a lot Q's of Q's nation.com here. So Q's nation.com. Follow me on Twitter. McAllister, Mike one. If you don't like officials, I'm your guy. I hate officials. I will <laughs> them all game long. Um, if you are expecting not to see bad calls called out during the game on Saturday, then don't follow me. But <laughs> if you enjoy that, then uh, by all means come follow me. And um, just because you're a Miami fan doesn't mean, you know, I, I don't want to interact with you t- during the game. So feel free to, to reach out and give your opinions and um, let's have fun. Sports are supposed to be fun. So let's do it. Canes fans don't like refs either. So uh, you're, you're, <laughs> nobody does. You're good there. So, all right, Mike, appreciate your time today. We'll have to talk during a uh, hoop season here. I mean, it's uh ACC plays right around the corner. So should be, should be an interesting season there as well. Can't wait. Thanks guys. Take care. This an insight to the games, and you know we ain't playing no games. Joaquin said dominate, so that's what we do. Home of the legends and seventh floor crew. Down in Miami where hurricanes brew. You here for the rumors we bring.